This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We end today's show remembering the author, the activist Barbara Ehrenreich, who's died at the age of 81, best known for her book Nickel and Dimed on not getting by in America. To research the book, she went undercover as a low-income, non-skilled worker at Walmart. She was a waitress at a restaurant. She worked in a nursing home and a cleaning service. She later founded the Economic Hardship Reporting Project. Barbara wrote more than 20 books, beginning in 1969, with Long March, Short Spring, The Student Uprising at Home and Abroad, a book about anti-war protests she co-wrote with her first husband, John Ehrenreich. In a moment, we'll hear Barbara in her own words. But first, Juan, um, I'm wondering if you can talk about how you knew Barbara Ehrenreich as someone you worked with, along with other members of the Young Lords, which you helped found in the early 70s here in New York. Yes, Amy. Uh, I actually met Barbara in 1969. She'd just come out of graduate school from her Ph.D. and had joined a group that really became a, a seminal group uh, in the radical critique of the American health care system. It was called uh, uh, the Health Pact, the Health Policy Advisory Council. And she joined it uh, fresh out of uh, uh, graduate school and joined an extraordinary group of radical and revolutionary doctors and nurses that had gathered in New York City at the time, people like Rob Burlidge, Ali and Charlotte Fine, uh, Ruth Galanter, Harold Osborne, who was over at Lincoln Hospital at the time. Uh, and Health Pact became sort of the nerve center for uh, the uh, the providing information to oppressed communities about the healthcare system. Of course, she and her former husband, John Ehrenreich, wrote the book, The, uh, the American Health Empire, Power, Profits, and Politics. And they really are credited with, with shaping this analysis of the health industrial complex of the United States and the extraordinary focus on profit in the American healthcare system. She really was a pioneer uh, in that. And I remember often meeting, uh, I th think it was 17 Murray Street, the health pack offices, all the radical who were involved in some sort of issues around health care would meet on a regular basis. And Barbara provided a lot of the research and, and uh, information that those of us who were organizing our communities didn't have at the time. A lot of the work we did in health care would not have happened. Uh, without the uh, the enormous uh, uh, reservoir of information that she provided to the Black Panther Party, the Republic of New Africa, the Young Lords, and other groups working in the Black and Brown communities, so she was and she was really a giant. And I recommend to people who don't know that part of Barbara's history to read an article she wrote about 20 years later. You can find it on the internet. It's called giving power to the people, the early days of Health Pack. And she credits to her experience at Health Pack with, real, with really shaping her entire uh, uh, worldview. Uh, and uh, of course, she went on to do many important and wonderful things. She's really one of the towering figures of the radical and progressive movement in America. And it's a, it's a tremendous loss, not only to her family, but to all who knew her and benefited from her work that she's passed away. Well, Juan, let's turn to Barbara Ehrenreich in her own words on Democracy Now! It was 2011, as she talked about why she went undercover to work as a low-income, uh, what is known as non-skilled worker, to write her classic book, Nickel and Dimed, on not getting by in America. Well, it, I took on a, a, a challenge that I set myself, which was to see whether I could support myself on the money I could earn in, well, obviously, entry-level jobs, uh, which are the, you know, kind of jobs where you go and apply, and they're not going to add, you know, they're not going to ask for a resume. They're not going to—they don't, they don't care about anything except whether you're a convicted felon or whether you have—you're actually, you know, it's legal for you to work in this country. And all these jobs— averaged at the time in um, around 2000 uh, about uh, seven dollars an hour even including the tips with waitressing uh, which at the it would be equivalent to about nine dollars an hour now and basically what I found that for me, just as one person, I wasn't trying to support my family with my earnings or anything like that. Uh, it, it just wasn't doable, because the rents were so out of line uh, with, uh, with, my, with my earnings. And I, I did—, I did 
try. I mean, I didn't spend anything, money, except on gas, food, and, um, uh, you know, the, the bare minimum, which was possible to do, because I, was in, I worked in each city for only a month. You know, so I wasn't depending on, you know, medical care or anything like that was not uh, coming through my jobs. But uh, I found, you know, a very important thing. Uh, well, two very important things. First, at $7 an hour or $9 an hour in today's dollars, you're not considered poor. You know, you don't show up in the poverty statistics. That You're considered to be fine if you're a one individual earning that much. And the other big lesson here is uh, which is maybe a hard one to remember at a time of high unemployment, is that jobs are not necessarily a cure for poverty. Jobs that don't pay enough to live on do not cure poverty. They condemn you, in fact, to a life of low-wage uh, labor and, and, and extreme insecurity. This figure, Barbara, of the number of Americans on food stamps almost one in six, almost 15 percent. The figures from May, um, people on food stamps uh, were 12 percent higher than a year earlier, according to the Agriculture Department. One in almost six Americans. And this applies directly to the people that you met, um, to the jobs that you took, for example, being a Walmart associate. Talk about that and um, the woman you wrote about and where she is today. Uh, yeah. I mean, one of the surprises to me—and it's not a surprise anymore, because a lot more research has been done—is how many uh, Walmart employees depend on some kind of government program to supplement their low wages uh, and pathetically inadequate health insurance, which most people can't afford anyway. In fact, when you—I uh, I, I noticed that uh, when I went through the orientation for my job at Walmart, and there was a whole table full of new hires sitting around, uh, you know, that they—the Walmart people asked to see whether anybody here might be eligible uh, for TANF, for example, ter Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, because they're kind of depending on that government—those government supplements uh, to keep people going. You're not going to do too well on just your Walmart pay. And then, at another time, as a Walmart associate, um, I went to seek uh, food aid. Um, I went to a pu sort of public slash private uh, charitable uh, place that you could get. Uh, you could come out with a sack of, of, of food. And when the interviewer, the social worker who interviewed me, kept getting me mixed up with somebody, uh, you know, I tell her that I had a car, and then she'd forget I had a car, and so on. Uh, and then she said, um, you know, it's just we we have other pe you know people are always coming from Walmart. You work at Walmart. I get you mixed up. And that, to me, was a big clue.